Fernando Alonso, a name needing little introduction, one of the greatest Sunday racers the sport has ever seen. The first driver to be inducted as a Hall of Fame driver in two disciplines under the FIA umbrella, and in 2021, he'll be responsible for the earliest title on the grid of all existing former and current world champions. He'll form a trio of drivers who have all won multiple titles in the past. But Alonso's masterclass was during an interesting time in the sport, when the red wave had a stranglehold on racing. But Raikkonen and Montoya had shown in the 2003 Battle Royale that even a god king can bleed. Alonso's 2005 performance helped pry the Ferrari grip from the Constructors' Trophy, and Renault would accomplish their first Constructors' Championship. Another notable change was that reigning champion Michael Schumacher was conspicuously absent this season. And I don't mean literally, he was there, kind of. But he would fail to classify in 60% of the first batch of races, and over the full course of the season, he'd only take five podiums. I mean, come on Nick, five podiums, that ain't bad, right? Right? And put it like this. Just a year prior, midway through the season, Shumi had already won every single race apart from his retirement in Monaco. That's eight in total out of a possible nine. He'd go on to take the top step 13 of the 17 races he'd be classified in. Fast forward to the 2005 season, and the Michael had only managed a single win at the halfway mark in Indianapolis. And it was under relatively dubious circumstances with only a six car start in the 2005 US Grand Prix farce. But I've talked about this before, so I'll spare you. Check it out after the video if you missed it. Comparatively, Renault would cruise to consecutive titles by razor-thin margins. While Ferrari fell out of the picture in the 2005 season for reasons that are to come next, McLaren would give chase to the French team only to have it unravel in the very last Grand Prix with Montoya's DNF. This 9-point margin, or 4.71%, gave way to the third closest finish in the history of the sport using percent margin as far as Constructors' Championships go. In Ferrari's 2006 resurgence, after they're recovering from FIA regulatory shifts, they would make Renault earn those championship honors, outdoing the previous year's battle with an epic campaign of their own, resulting in Renault's triumph landing in the top spot for the closest Constructors' Championship ever by a mere 5 points, or 2.43%. So, how did a driver that found himself in 4th place in the Drivers' Championship just a year prior catapult himself to victory the following season? And to truly understand how Renault and Alonso were able to disrupt Ferrari in their half decade of greatness, we need to look at the 2005 and 2006 seasons pretty deeply. So this video will be set up in two halves essentially. The first half will be about the 2005 season and all the dynamics that went into that. And based on that 2005 season, the FAA would reverse themselves on a couple key decisions and give us the 2006 season, which saw one of the best driver's championships, in my opinion, that we've ever seen in Formula 1 between two of the all-time greats. Thus, we'll follow the on-track performance and drama of the 2006 season a little bit more chronologically, race by race. Given these videos tend to be a deeper dive on some of these situations, I figured you'd like a little bit of change of pace. So, enjoy! Let's take a look at the 2005 regulation shifts, because that landscape is going to be important. Among the broad sweeping changes, you'd think that adjustments to the engine would be the source of such massive shifts in the grid shuffle. But in reality, it was a near-perfect blend of aero, engine, and tires. The engine. As it turns out, the new rule about the engine needing to last at least two races would play a significant impact across the grid. The war of attrition would commence. This was double the lifespan required of the engines just a year prior, and a breach of this rule, for any reason, would be accompanied by a 10-place grid penalty. The idea was twofold. Number one, limit the abuse the engines take to improve reliability. This would create better racing opportunities and just an overall better spectacle for the fans. And the second was that it served as a cost-cutting measure for teams who are particularly tight on cash. What Renault's R25 had on its side was reliability, and as it turns out, this would be a very powerful ally in the battle of the fittest. There wasn't a single Grand Prix the entire season that Fernando Alonso had a mechanical-related retirement. He did retire the car with suspension problems at the Canadian Grand Prix, but if you watch the race replay closely, you'll spot he clipped the wall of champions with 31 laps remaining. Both of the Renault cars would play a hand in repeating the previous year's result by retiring from the race, leaving the constructor's point slot empty. But dialing back power came at a cost. And this gamble paid off, as I'm sure many other drivers would envy Alonso's mechanical record in 2005 at the expense of some power output. Renault's Pat Simmons would be the first to concede their engine was not the most powerful, but by design. As it turns out, it would be McLaren that would be the main rival to Renault this season, and their pursuit of power seemed to be their Achilles heel. Raikkonen had a habit of having his knees cut out from under him as he would consistently find pace and get results while incurring engine penalty after engine penalty. Over the course of the season, 
he'd take four separate 10 grid place penalties for engine changes, which in turn would have an impact on his race results. But McLaren would seemingly find the breakthrough they needed to turn things around, but it was a little bit too little too late. Despite winning 10 races, including 7 of the final 9, Alonso and Renault had already done enough. But with the World Drivers' Championship wrapped up, there was still the Constructors' Championship to settle. After round 18 in Japan, Renault found themselves enjoying just a two-point gap to McLaren. But a spin on lap 24 from Montoya would ruin the finale drama, and Renault would cruise to a 9-point victory over McLaren, 191-182. to Further investigation proved that while a loose manhole cover was a culprit for the final round blow in Shanghai for Montoya and McLaren, Interestingly enough, it would be reflective of the odd season Montoya was having, and it all began with his tennis injury, which sidelined him for two Grand Prix early in the season. In the first two rounds, he posted finishes better than his teammate, but would return, possibly a little bit too hastily in fact, to significantly worse form, culminating in a bizarre black flag thanks to ignoring red lights exiting the pits while the safety car was still out, and this marked his second straight removal from the Montreal race. The penultimate race at Suzuka would be a perfect summation of the season for McLaren, Raikkonen would give a safe lap in the rain to start the race in 17th, just as many seconds off the top time. He was set to start the race with his 10th place penalty for, you guessed it, engine issues. Meanwhile, Montoya bailed on his lap and took B20, setting no time. The race wouldn't go much better for JPM, who would make contact with former champion of a different era, Jacques Villeneuve, on lap 1 sending him wide into the barriers, losing two wheels in the process. The Canadian would be hit with a 25 second penalty, but the damage was done. And worse still, to McLaren's dismay, Kimi was also in trouble early as he found himself cutting across the chicane and being passed as if he was moving still, and this would be at the very same corner that JPM was careening into the wall at high speeds. It seemed all but lost as Ron Dennis watched his constructor's fight disintegrate, and so began one of the greatest climbs in F1 history. Those engine problems earlier in the weekend didn't give Raikkonen much time with his car getting just 8 laps in practice. He came alive after the early incident though, opting to run on a heavy fuel load, he was slicing through the pack on the racer's track of Suzuka. Every handful of laps, it seemed that he had a new target in his sights to exploit and pick off. Patiently, methodically, he'd make his way up to the top. His MP420 brilliantly outmaneuvered Giancarlo Fisichella's Renault on the final lap to take the lead and win the Grand Prix in one of his finest to date. But it wouldn't matter. Fernando was too consistent and made fewer mistakes than any driver in 2005. And when you take a step back and look at the season, it became obvious that Alonso had just defeated a car stronger in the engine department. But again, don't take my word for it, Simmons would echo this sentiment in that same interview previously referenced. During the, the midsummer, we did feel that McLaren had moved ahead of us on power. We discussed it internally and our engine guy said, yeah, you can have more power, but you can't have more power and a guarantee to, to finish two races with an engine. Uh, McLaren had to watch the championship just slip away. And painfully, it wasn't even because they weren't quick enough. But engines, they don't win titles. Cars do. And on the whole, Renault had better adapted to the technical regulations, a set of changes that really did catch some teams out, especially in the aero department. The FAA's major push to improve overtaking resulted in not only just a change in size of both wings, but also in location. And in addition, noses were required to be lifted with the hopes that these changes would improve the perpetual wake problem F1 cars experience. The Scuderia were the most notable team that were caught napping as Rory Byrne initially reported a 25% reduction in downforce, which is consistent with the rest of the grid, which was a direct result of the changes in required specs on the car. The F2005 would not be raced until the third round in Bahrain, a hybrid of the highly successful predecessor. This Frankenstein's monster, the F2004M, garnered just 10 points and two retirements in the opening two rounds. And indeed, the 2004 champion was a solid car. Being competitive, well, that's always relative. Schumacher would incur six total retirements, but interestingly, the F2005's debut in Bahrain, well, that was responsible for the lone mechanical failure. Both drivers struggled to get a handle on the car, as it was clear they were light years off the pace. Barrichello's four podiums were only slightly bested by Michael, who brought home five of his own, including a win at Ferrari's 1-2 at the six-car sham in Indianapolis. It was pretty clear. Renault and McLaren had found a way to make the car work better in the new regulatory landscape. And to all the longtime fans out there that are scratching their heads going, yeah, Nick, wait, you're missing something. Not technically, I just happen to save the best for last. Aside from the aforementioned power problems, what bonded the top teams together was their use of the Michelin tires. And this, this right here turned out to be one of the largest factors that drove the biggest gap in performance relative to the previous season, the 2005 tire wars. And sure, using an old gearbox for a few Grand Prix, well that would lead to a noticeable pace drop off compared to the field. But Ferrari were off the pace for, well, most of the season. Ferrari had spent the better part of the dominant spell perfecting the art of short sprint racing. 
Ferrari's influence on the tire manufacturer's product steadily grew. By the 2005 season, only Ferrari, Jordan, and Minardi were using Bridgestone tires. And as they continued to optimize the tires to fit the strengths of the car, their ability to adapt to a sudden change in tire rules diminished. But why would the tire rules be limited? That wouldn't make any sense, and that's a reasonable thought. But when the 2005 season barred teams from switching tires while pitting, the Scuderia had no answer for this. Their entire car was built around that stint racing I mentioned. One could make a decent argument that because Michelin was more diversified in terms of the teams they represented, they had more of an obligation to apply best-in-class tire solutions based on the current regulations evenly across the field. Therefore, their blind spot was much smaller for this shock shift by the FIA, and they were far more agile in creating a solid race tire, and this was particularly noticeable at the top. Coupled with engine and aero changes, the tire rules changing made it clear 2005 was a year the FAA wanted racing to be focused on reliability. And on paper, there was a way to have it make sense, but there were some issues with this new rule as far as safety goes. The most notable example of this was Kimi Raikkonen's suspension failure at the Nürburgring, and this was as a direct result of a severely worn, flat-spotted tire. This led to the team bosses and the FAA agreeing to issue an amendment, and this ultimately would allow one change per Grand Prix in the case of a dire circumstance that may otherwise lead to safety issues. In the end, the two stars of the show were undoubtedly Fernando Alonso and Kimi Raikkonen. The two would take equal wins at 7 each, with the eventual champion pulling ahead on podiums 15 to 12. The momentum was with the Finn by the end of the season if you look at the results, and this would be a common trend and theme in this video. If you break the season down and compare after the breakthrough that McLaren had in Spain where Kimi would win the next 3 or 4 Grand Prix, he'd go on to take the lion's share of championship points after that event, finishing 105 to Fernando's 97. But that's not how racing works. I'm not a huge fan of revisionist history, but I am a fan of context. If you had to pinpoint it, Alonso's opening form punishing the grid, especially Kimi's lackluster 7 aggregate points to Nando's 36, it was this dominant form through approximately 20% of the season that powered him ultimately over the top to win his first title. While it was very evident the tires and Renault's ability to differentiate from the field were a major factor in the 2005 title battle, what absolutely no one can take away from Fernando is his consistency. He would show championship level form, avoiding catastrophe all season long aside from his one major error in Canada at the Wall of Champions. And when we started all of this, I warned you that this video would seem like it breaks off into two entirely different videos. Well, it kind of does. The 2006 season would prove to be a different beast entirely. The newly instituted tire rules would leave after just a single season. Great job, FIA. Great job, everyone over there who thought of that one. Brilliant. Well done. Well done. And as the door opened to shuffle out one very stupid rule, a familiar face would be welcomed right back to the front door. A classic tale of Old Warrior vs. Young Gun, Anakin Skywalker vs. Obi-Wan Kenobi, Bruce Wayne vs. Ra's al Ghul, and this turned out to be a proper driver's championship. Now that the focus of the FAA had shifted away from the clampdown of tire changes, teams were back to a more traditional cap at 14 sets per Grand Prix weekend. All season long, there was a persistent battle with the technical innovation that would come to be known as the Mass Damper. And this one is very, very important, so strap in. So what is the mass damper really? And no matter where you are on the fan spectrum, you've likely heard this before. And to be thorough, it is the tuned mass damper or active mass damper. I'll refer to it as AMD or TMD throughout this. And when thinking of the mass damper as it relates to Formula One, it's best to think of it as a highly choreographed dance built around maths. Now it's all centered around a roundish or oval like plate that's dropped perfectly into a cylindrical containment. And in the case of the R25 and the R26 for that matter, it was to balance out the vertical oscillations of the natural ride height that came in the vibrations of the track. So not horizontally, this is to focus on the vertical movements. And this idea of unsprung versus sprung weight, that's very important. The sprung weight is all of the weight that's held up by the powertrains. So you've got the wheels, the driver, the skeleton of the car, etc. And this contrasts directly with the idea of unsprung weight, which is anything not held up directly by the suspension. Now again, just remember, generally speaking, the lower the unsprung weight, the less stress on the springs that the car is going to have to endure, and that's going to be less stress due to the oscillations in the natural movement of the car. And now tying this off, it's reasonable to expect that the less oscillations the car is going to actually have, the better the grip. And when we talk grip, here we're talking mechanical grip. And typically, mechanical grip is very, very hard to control in Formula 1. So much about the car is always in motion and in flux. And due to the fact that the ride height is always changing, and that is the distance from the underside of the car to the actual track itself, it's very hard to predict what's gonna come next. And when you have a ride height that's consistent, not only can the designers and the teams and the engineers start to plan around that, you can give the driver a lot more confidence going into turns. 
and a confident driver is a quicker driver. So ultimately, the mass damper had the tremendous benefit of restricting disruption to the all-important aerodynamics to the underside of the car. That's where all the magic happens. And I know what you're thinking. Why don't you just drop the car down as low as possible? Then you're getting maximum mechanical grip advantages. You may have to fight bottoming the car out, but who cares? Sparks are pretty and all, but too much of them, and you've got yourself a problem. The 2006 Showdown. The first half of the season, it was all Renault. The R2603 was the single chassis of choice for Alonso's power in 2006 to fight Schumacher. The German and the Spaniard would battle it out, with Renault and Ferrari now in the thick of things. The intense on-track action and rivalry gave us the closest Constructors' Championship margin since the title event was officially put on in 1958, and this is judged by using the percent of points change. And in the beginning, it appeared that Alonso was walking his way into becoming the world's youngest double world champion. And to put it in perspective, from round 1 through round 9, the exact halfway point in the calendar, the reigning champion had yet to do worse than runner-up, taking the top step of the podium 6 times, or 67%, including quad wins consecutively. And already here, I think it's important to note something. Regardless of the mastery the Renault team was showing regarding the mass damper implementation and just their overall package, Alonso was still incredibly consistent yet again. For reference, Fisichella would take a win in Malaysia and found himself absent from the podium a total of 78% of the time. Alonso managed to win the same amount of races as the Italian veteran had in top 5 finishes. And after just 3 rounds, Fernando's lead would open up to double that of the next drivers, which happened to be Fisichella and Raikkonen, deadlocked at 14 points. Schumacher would be matched by Button's 11 points and Renault a comfortable 27 points ahead of the Scuderia. Alonso was making a statement, and it was clear, the wave of young talent was real. And adding to the evidence was future world champion Nico Rosberg, who set the record at his first Grand Prix for the youngest driver to set the fastest lap, which he held for the better part of a decade. Helping things along was the Schumacher-led Scuderia was off to a tough start. The piston failure on their 2006 Challenger resulted in a 10th place grid penalty for Michael in round 2, and this mechanical issue had spread its tentacles further than just Michael. Three of the Ferrari-powered cars found some engine problems on Saturday in that round. The seven-time champion was still struggling to accept he doesn't have enough car. This would result in him overcompensating and he'd lose it on lap 32, bending it into the wall. If there was trouble to be had in 2006, Ferrari seemed to have a knack for finding it early on in the season. And after the double retirement the Marinello outfit endured at the 2006 Australian Grand Prix, they would go nearly another decade before both cars would fail to classify like this. And ironically, it was Kimi who was in one of those Ferrari cars that ended the streak of at least one car classifying. But let's rewind back to 2006. His follow-up showing after that 2005 impressive challenge, it was already a tough one. His nightmarish start saw another suspension failure in the debut, but it didn't really slow him down, and it actually would prove that his only limitation was the car itself, as he'd battle back from one of the largest deficits on record to take the final podium spot, marking his 31st champagne spray already. And in round 2, it looked like Raikkonen was having yet another suspension failure, but it was at the hands of an overzealous Christian Clean. So if Alonso was to be pushed to the end, it looked like it was not going to be the Finn this year, who was going to be battling more the car than other competitors. And it was unclear whether Ferrari would be the answer, but they surely had some fight left in them after all. The technical issues they were plagued with had limited the power through rounds 2 and 3, but with the commencement of the European stretch of the calendar, and namely San Marino, they began to find their way again and the Ferrari upgrades which included an improved aero package, a beefing up of their engine, and revised suspension showed that the car was more formidable. The benefits around track were actually pretty evident and immediately, with Schumacher taking consecutive wins. But the tire wars had emerged front and center yet again as Michelin made some advancements in their spec rubber, fueling Alonso to take a home win and with it the momentum. And this is a very important moment and one that doesn't get talked about enough. If Alonso doesn't win here, especially at his home Grand Prix, I think this changes the entire championship. This took the wind out of the Ferrari sails, which it needed to happen if he had any chance, given that the Ferrari upgrades and all the performance that came with it, well, they were here to stay. Alonso held a firm grip on his advantage he had over Schumacher in the grid for the next three rounds to complete the halfway mark in the championship, but not before one of the worst moments of the season, and it would come in Monte Carlo, where Schumacher would park his car at Rascas after claiming to lock up. There was essentially unanimous agreement not only in the paddock but within the stewards room that Schumacher did this unnecessarily and intentionally to spoil any attempts to take the provisional pole to which he had just earned, knowing full well that if he put his car here, it would bring out a flag, and this flag would inevitably slow the field down. And for what it's worth, it did work. Alonso did look like he was going to take that pole position, but the cautionary flag cost him some precious lap time. But in the end, it actually wouldn't go Schumacher's way. He'd be forced to start with his teammate from the back of the grid. 
This would be yet again another bad omen for Ferrari on the season. This would be the very first instance of the Scuderia starting both cars at the very back of the pack. One of the stewards would deliver this very frank appraisal of the situation. Fernando would go on to take the win and extend his lead over Schumacher to 21 points. Rounds 8 and 9 went to the Spaniard for his 5th and 6th win of the season, and at this point in the season, Michael was still hanging in there, albeit barely, as Alonso's commanding 25 point lead after the conclusion of the first leg of the North American doubleheader was hard to ignore. Since the upgrades Ferrari fitted to the car in Italy, Schumacher's Monaco fiasco would be the only misstep off the podium. The second half of the season would kick off emphatically going the way of Ferrari, as they would take their first one-two finish in a year, but this time, it was legit, coming off Indy's six-car sham from the previous year. And this came as a shock to just about no one, given how well Michael does stateside, taking his fourth straight win at the USGP. And given I live just about an hour from this track, I remember this one. Michelin blamed their conservative specs on being overly cautious given last year's events. No matter the reasons, Schumacher would take a net six points in the championship, and thus would begin the official pendulum swing in the battle. Of the back half of the championship, Ferrari took seven of the nine races, with Schumacher responsible for five of those wins himself. Massa would grab his first victory, follow up by clinching the season finale, and this would make for extraordinary TV, especially for Ferrari, as he would take an emotional home victory in his maiden season with the Scuderia. And finally, we arrive at the most important single event of the 2006 season. Schumacher's trifecta of wins would be capped off by the FIA's controversial decision to officially henceforth deem the mass damper illegal. And the reason this is so controversial is due to the fact that the FIA had multiple opportunities to declare the system illegal, but it wasn't until round 12 that it would make its exit. They were well aware that Renault had been implementing this innovation at the end of the 2005 season, yet its production was allowed to continue. And furthermore, other teams had actually developed their own version of this device. Ferrari, Red Bull, and Toro Rosso, as well as the then Midland team. And in my assessment, the difference was that the R26 was actually built around this device. And briefly, let's go through the logic by which it was banned by the FIA. Here on screen, you'll see a list of all of the things that the car must comply with in terms of influencing its performance as it relates to the bodywork. And it wasn't as if the FIA was just grasping at straws. They had a reasonable case to make. That's not really the issue here. And you can tell they meant business. They brought in world-renowned engineer and no stranger to the F1 world, Peter Wright. You know, the guy responsible for basically overhauling how we look at aerodynamics, responsible for the Lotus Wind Tunnel program, that guy. And if you want to actually see the full details of the testimony itself, I've created a document down in the description. You can just click it and find it. It'll give you all of the meeting notes and the actual arguments and debates that were actually made in court by both sides. The ruling felt like one more out of principle rather than applied theory. Fans over the years have taken issue with the ruling, but I believe that this is more to do with timing. My own personal gripe with the situation is that the FIA cleared the systems at all. They were right to stamp out the spread of the exploit, as I believe that this would have gotten out of hand. Honda themselves had plans to deploy their own version of the AMD, but in their scenario, they were adding a second one to the car. Having looking at the letter of the law and the language in the regulations itself, as well as studying the testimonies, I'm hesitant to agree this classifies as a quote, aerodynamic device, end quote, given it encounters no airflow, I'd also object to the idea that it's a movable part, given the interaction of the damper disc, fluid, and the springs. Historically speaking, the FIA has always found a way to advance the hunting or challenging team. In the case of the R25, I actually speculate they eagerly welcomed any disruption to the Ferrari dominance, even if that meant capitulating to a design that was on the border of legality. But having bent the knee to the R25, they opened Pandora's box. It was a tricky situation because, as we'll see, you can make a strong case Renault may not have actually won the championship without that device. Additionally, the spread was already beginning, notably with the exit of Rob Marshall from Renault, the key figure who was actually responsible for inventing the entire innovation fitted to an F1 car. Just one season after the success of the R25, he would actually leave in the 2006 season to go help Red Bull make their own version of this. McLaren, the team that actually lodged the initial complaint, had also failed in their attempt at the AMD. But in a move consistent with F1 cynicism, years prior to the FIA banning the AMD, they had been developing their own secret device that was pretty similar, and it was a different variation of it, known as the J-Damper. We'll save that for another day. The FIA would have to step in eventually as it became increasingly more clear the focus on the device is to improve aerodynamics, and that is unequivocally against the regulations. A couple great examples of this include the BMW tower wings, which were surely within the regulations, however, they were banned later after passing inspection. And a more modern one comes courtesy of the Mercedes DAS system. And because Renault, more than any other car on the grid, had actually been working with this device and built a car around it, they were likely going to be the team that was most affected. But all teams complied and the show went on. 
Next up on the grid, Hungary. The race presented a massive opportunity should someone have seized it. Both of the top contenders would be handed penalties in practice, and during the race itself, Alonso would work his way into the lead, but a pit stop error would thwart his plans, and he found out about the error in a not so pleasant way. The car became uncontrollable, and Schumacher was unable to capitalize on the situation as his strategy to race on enters would be a few laps too short. As he was being passed, he made contact with another car, which forced him to retire prematurely. But the DQ of Robert Kubica would ultimately mean he was promoted back into the points to P8 as Button took his first victory after starting from a distant P14 impressively. Next up was the Temple of Speed, Ferrari's home event in front of the Tifosi, and it was an important event for Schumacher in the championship. And given the back and forth nature of the championship, it was pretty amazing to see Ferrari actually pull ahead of Renault by a mere three points at the conclusion of the race. Schumacher was just a couple of points down off Alonso's tally with all the momentum, and by Shanghai, Michael had finally done it. His incredible victory in China not only proved that the Ferrari was the best in class car at the time, it also brought him dead even with Alonso on points in the championship. And this deadlock going into the penultimate race was really important because ahead on countback, that was Schumacher. If it ends like this, he takes the title. But the Renault pairing's double podium in China saw them overtake Ferrari's short-lived constructor's advantage by a single point, with Fisichella overtaking Massa in the Drivers' Championship by the exact same margin. And this would ultimately be the final win of Schumacher's long historic tenure in the sport. And just because by this time the Scuderia's 248 was thought to be the strongest in the field, it did not make Michael mechanically impervious. Suzuka would be a testament to that. The race was incredibly important given that it would inevitably lead one of the drivers ahead going into the final round. In the gap between Schumacher and Alonso, it hasn't been down to single digits since round 2 in Malaysia, and things were looking good for Michael, but while leading the Japanese Grand Prix, his title hopes were dashed as the engine would fail with just 16 laps to go while leading the race. That's not to say it didn't happen to Fernando as well though, he suffered the same fate 3 short races ago. And for anyone still sore about this blow, thinking Michael deserved the title if not for reliability, consider this. Schumacher would go 111 races without a single mechanical retirement that would force him to not be classified at the hands of engine failure. But Michael's mechanical troubles left the door open for Fernando to snatch the win after qualifying 5th and pull ahead in the championship by 10 points. He would need one alone point to secure his second consecutive title before heading to McLaren for what would be an unforgettable inter-team rivalry between rookie sensation Lewis Hamilton. And for the finale, there was only one scenario in which Schumacher had a path to be the champion. And that was the fate from the previous Grand Prix would need to be reversed, with Alonso failing to score and Schumacher winning the race outright. And meanwhile, in the team championship, Renault would need to score just 10 points total to guarantee the victory regardless of what Ferrari did. The finale would prove to get complicated pretty quickly. Michael was starting in P10, fighting through the field, doing his best to make up crucial ground. With Massa on pole, if he could join him for a 1 2 finish and just hope that Renault were only capable of a P3 and a P6, which was pretty reasonable given where the drivers started, they'd end the season in yet another tie, but Ferrari would win on countback. But like much of 2006 for the Marinello outfit, it just wasn't meant to be. In an incident that is still debated today, Schumacher would quickly work his way up four places, only to make contact with Fisichella after the restart. This resulted in the seven-time champion having to drop all the way back down the grid to a distant P18, essentially an entire lap down from his teammate who was leading the race. In his final race in red overalls, Schumacher still put on a good show, fighting his way through the pack again to P4, missing the podium by a handful of seconds. Fernando's P2 was good enough for an eight-point net change in the championship, and it would give him his second title. Fisichella's three additional points put Renault clear Ferrari by five points. The 2006 season is a great example of why the development wars are so crucial and entertaining for Formula 1. It marks, at least in my opinion, the second straight year that the championship winning car wasn't actually the most powerful, depending on how you define that of course. But in today's regulatory environment, this just isn't all that possible. Ultimately, had the season begun after the Ferrari upgrades in San Marino, Schumacher would have won the championship 110 to Fernando's 106. And again, shoulda, coulda, woulda, just like Kimmy's example in 2005, but you get my point. And Schumacher's ability to win races, that's what kept him in the fight, as the two dueling powers would each grab seven wins, but Fernando's consistency is what pushed him over the edge. He would take three more podiums than Michael with an average finish rate of 1.94 versus Michael's 2.56. So when you step back and actually look at Fernando's titles, they actually spanned two very different seasons with two very different sets of rules. And Michael may have been just a tad past his peak, but one could argue he was definitely more motivated than ever, and this could have compensated for some of that. And there's no doubt that this was prime Kimi Raikkonen. I mean, judging by his 2007 results, we get all the proof we need. And while the circumstances may have changed over Alonso's reign, his driving and performance did not. He remained steady, steadfast, and focused. And it showed. And while some of his career isn't as shiny and polished as this, 
What you can't deny is that these two seasons is what greatness is made of. He was responsible for upending one of the most dominant spells in F1's history by one of the most storied teams in Grand Prix racing. It takes a little bit more than just a good car and some luck to pull that off, and this all-important reign was responsible for kicking off a change in the landscape of Formula 1, a reign that must be remembered for having world champions giving chase and applying tremendous pressure to no avail. Alonso's reign. I hope you enjoyed this installment of this specific series. Make sure to come back and check out any other series that are being created, and I'll see you very, very soon.